welcome to the IOC Proof 2020 Evidence to Practice in a nutshell, where we aim to link the latest evidence to inform practice. I'm your host, Nirmala Pereira. Today we have the pleasure of having Professor Carolyn Emery with us. And she's somebody that doesn't need a, need introduction. She's the uh, chair of the Canadian Injury Prevention Research Center in Calgary. And her research field includes sports injury epidemiology. She's done lots of randomized controlled trials in injury prevention in um, youth sports and rehabilitation um, and pediatric sports medicine. Also, um, there's, uh, she's also done some research associated with Alberta team osteoarthritis um, relating to preventing of, uh, of injury and osteoarthritis um, as a consequence of injury. And, um, and we all know her very well about Caroline's research into um, concussion prevention as well, which we discuss a little bit about. But before we go any further, congratulations, Caroline, for delivering um, for your keynote at the 2020 Monaco um, IOC conference in March. Um, and uh, I'm really very much looking forward to it, so given somebody that's interested in youth injury. Well, thanks very so much. I'm really looking forward to it as well. Yeah. The pressure's on. <laughs> the pressure's on to entertain and hopefully get a good message. Uh, it will be. It will be a great, great uh, keynote because the topic is. Um, it's about injury prevention in youth sport and why are we so afraid of change? So there will be a lot of insight, I guess, straight into what's already been done so far and the future directions. Uh, really future. looking, looking forward to it. So. Uh, so today uh, we will talk a little bit about target for injury prevention in youth sports uh, and looking at specifically at rule modification, training strategies, e uh, equipment recommendations and a bit about neuromuscular training programs. So before we go any further, my first question to you is, I know that you're very passionate about youth sports and injury prevention in youth sports. Why? Well, I think it started uh, many years ago uh, in the 80s when I started to practice as a physiotherapist in pediatrics specifically. Um, and I was very interested in, uh, in sport medicine uh, uh, and um, in orthopedics, uh, neurology. And I saw a lot of kids come through the door that uh, had injuries um, that would lead to pretty significant consequences, um, be it head injury or a significant knee injury. And I felt that there was a lot that we could do as physiotherapists to move upstream and to be able to prevent some of these injuries in healthy kids who are participating in sport, really with the outcome being trying to uh, increase participation in sport, recreation and physical activity uh, over the lifespan. Yeah, yeah that's a... Uh... And then you have done, you know, decades of work on, on the, in this area. So usually pe pediatric sports injury prevention and Carolyn Carol Emery is kind of well, you know, in, in the field. And I played a lot of sports. That's what happens when you're actually not very good at any yeah. one sport. You end up uh, playing a lot of different sports. And uh, so certainly have had a lot of opportunity myself for injury and concussion. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then I also have uh, two kids who always challenged me with uh, many different sports, um, including uh, skiing and uh, skiing and snowboarding, uh, ice hockey. So we've had lots of injuries and concussions in our household. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a coach, actually, uh, particularly in ice hockey, uh, I felt that there was a great deal that we could do to uh, reduce the burden, particularly of concussion in this sport. Um, so I guess my passion does come from uh, from many different angles. Yeah, which is perfect. So um, let's talk about low-hanging fruit, um, primary prevention of injuries, where you have invested a lot of your time in, uh, because prevention is better than cure, as you said uh, before. So neurovascular training in youth sports um, that um, have one of the greatest public health implications because it prevents from injuries from happening, but also the long-term consequences of musculoskeletal injuries that can develop into uh, post-traumatic osteoarthritis and, and the likes. So um, what have you found so far in terms of neuro, the RCTs that you've done in neuromuscular in, uh, injury prevention programs? Um, and the ability to prevent uh, or reduce the risk of injuries. 
So Where can we get? <laughs> yeah, so we've done a lot of sports-specific neuromuscular training warm-up programs, uh, uh, similar to many of our colleagues internationally. Um, our focus has been in youth sport, and we did our first randomized controlled trial in Calgary uh, in youth soccer. Uh, and then moving on to basketball. And uh, we have also done uh, a number of um, programs uh, that are, are, are less sports specific and actually delivered in physical education class. So uh, targeting all sports and uh, more generalized neuromuscular training program that can be done as part of the physical education program. We've demonstrated uh, a preventative effect of uh, more than 38% more than in all of our studies. And uh, most recently, our findings in junior high school uh, demonstrate an even greater protective effect of neuromuscular training. So really exciting findings. Um, but of course, the challenges uh, are around adherence and long-term maintenance of these programs. And uh, we're currently working with many of our community partners uh, and uh, delivering uh, many coach and teacher workshops for neuromuscular training uh, prevention strategies across numerous sports as well as in the context of physical education. So hopefully the plan will be to uh, upscale uh, this uh, nationally and to be able to evaluate that uh, across, uh, across the country. But as we know, the implementation context changes wherever you go and a yeah. uh, really important thing to understand uh, so that we can really maximize the adherence of some of these programs. Yeah. And I like the idea that you um, implemented some of these programs in schools, not just using sports clubs, because I think a lot of the research available uh, with the implementing neuromuscular programs are mainly at sports clubs. Uh, for team sports, usually. That's and true. And they already use the schools that that's true that and utilized so that was yeah. very innovative thinking from yeah. your, your point well i think in in physical education as well the teachers have some flexibility to change up the program components a little bit to make them specific to the particular sport that they're uh wor they're working with at that time yeah. um, in the class which is great um giving them uh you know some ability to, to, to champion uh some modifications to the program as well and yeah. i think that's really important uh, also yeah and um, can you just please tell us a little bit more about the shred injury platform? I think you touched a little bit about it. Uh, sure. Sure. So we've um, we talk about our program called Shred Injuries or Shred Concussions, and uh, Shred stands for surveillance in high schools uh, to reduce the risk of injuries and their consequences. And so uh, we recently uh, have uh, received some funding from the NFL Scientific Advisory Board and the focus there is shred concussions and it's really about uh, prevention of concussions across multiple high risk sports in youth. We're doing this across the country. Uh, we will be recruiting 6,000 kids from 60 schools and uh, that will be across five provinces. And a real opportunity, I think, to inform uh, changes in practice and policy related to prevention and management, but also doing a great deal of work with our multidisciplinary team across the country to understand better biomarkers uh, for uh, predicting concussion and predicting recovery as well. Um, so that will be a significant component uh, of our program there. So it's a very exciting program. And uh, our injury surveillance platform, um, we call Shred Injuries broadly, and we will uh, be collecting information related to both concussions as well as all injuries in youth sport um, over the next number of years. Yeah. So really exciting. Yeah, very exciting and um, kind of very um, type of research that can change your policies, as you said. And, and practices uh, with the, with a very high impact. So looking forward to so. read about it uh, and learning yeah. more about it. In we, the, we do our best future. to reduce that time from uh, um, from publication to actually uh, having an impact, and and I think that's a really important component of of how we decide our priorities around uh, our research program. Uh, the research that you have done contributed to rule modifications and policy, especially in terms of concussion mm -hmm. um, research, because uh, recently they disallowed body checking in hockey or ice hockey. Well, as, that's uh, right. As we the just, rest uh... of the world like to call. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, hockey that's hockey for Canadians yeah. um, and and which led to 50 percent reduction of injuries can you talk a little bit more about this and how this policy sure came into action? sure well I can say that uh, this only happened because of our uh, fantastic partnership we've had with our local uh, ice hockey community in, in Calgary and in Edmonton uh, Vancouver Toronto as well as Hockey Canada and uh, we have uh, really done this work over the last decade to demonstrate uh, fourfold greater risk of concussion in leagues that allow body checking and particularly in 11 and 12 year olds in peewee ice hockey where the concussion rates were very high and uh, so this work uh, led to uh, an evidence-informed policy change and uh, who championed that change was hockey canada and uh, and certainly what we've uh, demonstrated is a significant reduction in concussions and all injury. Uh, in fact, preventing over 4,800 concussions annually in 11 and 12 year old ice hockey. So this has actually informed now a change in older age groups. So in Bantam, 13 and 14 year olds, as well as Midget, 15 to 17 year olds, where in many places in Canada, uh, locally and in some provincial organizations, there's no body checking uh, allowed in games in non-elite levels of play. So this is some 60% of, uh, of players actually who are in competitive ice hockey. Um, so they're now playing in leagues where uh, body checking is disallowed uh, in games. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we're seeing a, a significant impact in the reduction of concussions and injuries in older age groups now as well. That is very impressive and, and it kind of highlights the importance of having this relationship with your key stakeholders and having them on board that, you know, willing to translate and champion the, the findings from your research and, and turn them into policies or rule changes. Absolutely. And, and I would argue the key is to have those community partners uh, at the table from the beginning. Yeah. Make sure you're asking the relevant research questions for their community. Uh, and um, and then have have them involved as uh, stakeholders throughout the research process from de determining your questions all the way through um, data collection and the support for um, for uh, dissemination and uh, and knowledge translation is huge. I agree. Can't agree more. So just moving on a little bit. So what I um, just want to touch on training strategies in youth sports. Do you have any examples of uh, best practices uh, for, uh, for training strategies and how we can reduce the risks of injuries? Yeah, so, uh, so most of my research uh, related to uh, training strategies is, is, as we discussed already, neuromuscular training warm-up programs. And um, certainly, uh, you know, a low-hanging fruit. We know they work. And uh, we really need to, uh, to figure out how we can uh, increase their use across multiple sports and, um, and uh, school-based sport. I think that um, there's also an opportunity perhaps for training uh, with respect to tackle training in some sports such as American football uh, and rugby. And uh, lots of discussion about uh, the tackle in rugby right now internationally. And um, as you can imagine, um, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, not our, our primary sport uh, in Calgary, uh, but our concussion rates and injury rates are, are extremely high in high school rugby. And so we're actually pa uh, partnering with, uh, with Bath University, who's done a lot of work in uh, youth rugby. And I think that, um, you know, together we can, we can really have an impact. And I expect that uh, there the, the components that will be critical are um, implementing neuromuscular training, uh, warm-up programs, um, but also perhaps considering uh, with uh, partnering with Rugby Canada, uh, what we are going to do from the perspective of uh, a research uh, program related to the tackle. And uh, it won't be us that drives what that research yeah. question is. It will be uh, it will be uh, Rugby Canada and uh, our community partners certainly that will do that. Yeah. I think there's some research done in New Zealand of quite a lot with the relation to tackle. Um, yes, of course, yeah, absolutely. Sure yeah. yeah, and I think yes. our biggest issue in Canada is that actually most kids are not exposed to rugby mm. prior to high school. Yeah. 
And so they're 15 years old and particularly in girls rugby, a lot of them have not been exposed to collision sport before. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden they're, they're playing a sport uh, with tackle. And um, I think that uh, there's uh, a few different options um, perhaps that we can help to, uh, to reduce the risk of concussions and injuries yeah. and uh, increase the safety uh, in the sport as, um, as uh, those kids are learning to play. Yeah. Um, okay, so just uh, touched a little bit, uh, or we did actually touch a little bit about any equipment mm -hmm. recommendations. Do you have any suggestions based on your research? Uh, what equipment can we use uh, to reduce risk of injuries uh, in youth sports? Yeah, absolutely. So we know helmets work uh, in cycling and skiing and snowboarding. Uh, and some of the work that we've done more recently is in sports where, such as ice hockey, uh, is to better understand how important helmet fit is. And in some of our uh, preliminary work, which isn't published yet, uh, I think that there's um, certainly promise for uh, a development of helmet fit criteria and ensuring um, a good helmet fit to reduce the risk of concussion. And uh, there'll be more... Uh, more coming out uh, in the next year uh, from our research program in that regard. I think the other one uh, to be considering is mouth guard use in youth sport. And um, we've had uh, pre preliminary results presented uh, in abstract form, demonstrating a significant uh, reduction um, in the odds of concussion with mouth guard uh, use in youth ice hockey. Um, and, uh, and that's based on a nested case control study. Uh, and uh, the more, uh, the multivariable analysis will be published uh, soon, we hope. And, uh, and I expect that that will have uh, uh, some uh, effect in informing uh, policy change uh, to go back to a mandate for mouth guard use in youth ice hockey. We're gonna be doing more work through shred concussions uh, related to mouth guards across multiple sports, so American okay. football um, as well as rugby. Yes, a lot of it will be on display through your colleagues, PhD students and collaborators at the IOC conference as well. Um, Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I certainly um, have the opportunity to work with many undergraduate students, graduate students, and postdoctoral scholars who really drive uh, many projects in the, in the context of our research program in injury prevention and the prevention of consequence of injury. Um, so I'm really uh, fortunate to be able to surround myself with uh, so many uh, bright stars and uh, yeah, really look forward to um, their contributions um, at uh, the conference as well. Yeah. So just to wrap, before we wrap it up, uh, if I'm a clinician looking after pediatric athletes with your many years of experience as a clinician, researcher, coach, parent, um, and any all other roles that you've played as well, um, three clinical pearls. Uh, so I think I would start with, um, as a physiotherapist, the opportunities that we have face-to-face -face with families and kids following injury, take that opportunity uh, to, to really be able to uh, educate um, this community about prevention. We have, uh, I think, a role to play upstream in prevention where we can have a huge uh, effect uh, from a public health um, reduction of injury perspective. Uh, so, so I think uh, that uh, we need to put our prevention hats on in the clinic. Uh, I think that's important. Um, I would also uh, suggest that we have a significant role to play in injury recurrence. So we know that kids who have had a significant knee injury, an ACL injury, uh, ACL repair, um, that the risk is about 30% uh, of another injury on the same side or the contralateral side. Same thing with concussion. 30% uh, of concussions that we see um, in our acute sport uh, concussion clinic are recurrent. So I think we have a role to play in secondary prevention uh, to prevent the recurrence of injury, make sure that kids are not going back uh, too early uh, to sport and make sure that um, uh, they're uh, up to speed in terms of, um, in terms of their uh, training strategies uh, to actually uh, enter back into competition. 
And I think the third role that we have to play um, is uh, with, with each and every um, patient we see um, to be thinking long term, to be thinking about um, lifelong participation in sport and physical activity. And so the opportunity to understand more about how we can prevent consequences of injury, be it post-traumatic osteoarthritis or post-concussion syndrome, um, there are things that we can do as clinicians um, in, from a multidisciplinary perspective, I think, to prevent consequences of injury. So I think I've covered primary, secondary, and tertiary <laughs> prevention. So um, that's really uh, the, the three things, I think, yeah. uh, based the, on your question. Yeah, and the last question, given your expertise as a professor, uh, a well-renowned researcher, and the chair of one of the IOC research centers, so if you're an up and coming researcher, PhD student, honor student, master student, anybody looking to do, interested in researching pediatric or youth sports injuries, what, uh, what do you see is the most important or priority areas that uh, for focus or future research directions? Yeah. Well, I guess what I would say is that we have a lot more work to do. I think we've raised the bar methodologically in our field over the last decade. And I think that um, really the field is wide open uh, to do work that will have a significant public health impact, whether it's in primary, secondary, uh, or tertiary prevention. Uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, to be able to better inform practice and policy in reducing the burden of concussions and injuries in youth sport and recreation. And, uh, and I would say that um, what's really important is as you, uh, as you head into uh, this field, um, as an early career person and or um, as, a, as a graduate student interested in, in doing research in the field, um, that um, you uh, pick an area that you're passionate about. Because I can say that uh, I think that you'll go a lot further if you're you're working in an area that uh, you you really enjoy and you're investing um, many years of your life to train towards um, a career and in and and, uh, and so it's important to uh, to really be working in a field that uh, is is exciting to you and um, and uh, and and also where um, perhaps um, you know you have some credibility from a, a sport perspective or a clinical perspective try to marry those things together um, in uh, in terms of research uh, with with a sport that you play or that you um, that you coach um, or aligned with your your clinical expertise as well I, I think that will take you a long way in the field yeah thank you so much so great uh, fantastic tip tips for those up and coming researchers or those uh, thinking about getting into research. So um, thank you, Car Carolyn, for being here and talking to us. Great. Well, thanks very much for uh, having me. It's nice to be back in Oxford and uh, great to chat.